Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you, and uh, it's good to good to be back. Thank you for your prayers for our uh, group that went to, to Gatlinburg. It was good to be back with Smoky Mountain Resort Ministries, and uh, we still got to minister a little bit differently this year, but it was a great time and uh, a new location that we got to go to. So thank you uh, for your prayers. We got to tune in and watch the service while we were up there. Uh, but we welcome you to First Baptist Church if you're a guest with us. Uh, we especially welcome you, and on the way in, we had an um, order of worship, hopefully, that you have picked up, and there is a Connect card, so we know of your presence here today, if you can fill that out, and for our members as well, if you can fill that out, and uh, this is a full order of worship. There's some other things in here that I want to point out, and the first one is our standing committees. It's this time, uh, time of year uh, to be in prayer, to, to prayerfully think about ways that you can minister in our church. And, uh, you know, our, our committees are really ways to, to minister in our church, and there's a whole variety of, of these. And uh, so um, there's a form here. Um, you may know right now today, to uh, I would like to serve, or there might be several of them that you're interested in. Mark those down and put your name so we can contact you. Um, if you're not sure today, hold that, you know, hold that with you. You can bring back Wednesday night or, or next Sunday and uh, keep that with you or, or contact the church office and let us know. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Please look over those and, and be in prayer for those. Another announcement, I'm going to let Matt do this, is, is on the other side of the Connect card, you'll see a few opportunities, and Matt's going to talk about that. And that means I'm going to say the whole, we love to hear this sound of everybody in here tearing this Connect card off while you write information down on it that you're going to leave for us, but I'll let Ben cover the rest of that. This is a very important year for drive through Nativity because... Y'all, we're going to need help this year. If we're going to pull this off, this is the year that we would be the most challenged to put enough people willing and able to do this. So I am asking you, you all, including folk listening online, if there is any chance that you would be willing to help us with the drive through nativity, we need your help. If we're going to do it this year, we need to do it well because we believe a lot of people will come. So please, please volunteer to help us with the drive through Nativity, and we will be in touch with you in the weeks to come. And while I'm here, I'm going to point out one other, because I can, and that is T-shirt. You see a little thing of T-shirt. There's been an announcement about T-shirts up here. After church, I'd love for you guys to go through the atrium and sign up, pre-order a church T-shirt. There are two options. They're going to be $20, and all you need to do is let us know what size they are. If we can convince you to pay for them ahead of time, so much the better. But we need to know how many of these that we're ordering. We think that cheap church t-shirts are great, and everybody should have one, so that when you are out and about, you can let people know that you're a part of First Baptist Church. So please, on your way out, swing through the atrium and pre-order one of these t-shirts. Thank you. All right, so drive through Nativity, the sign up, uh, Wednesday night meal is there. Um, upper red, uh, early bird registration is underway, and uh, that information can be found in the office. We have that, and also there's a link uh, that will be there if you want to uh, sign up online. Um, uh, another, uh, another announcement, just because I don't have time usually down here with the kids. This is about um, if you're a family with, with children, uh, with our children's church time. Uh, we have wonderful volunteers, and we've had some new volunteers come on. And uh, just like our other ministries that we have uh, with Tiny Kid, Teen Kid, and uh, Sunday School classes, uh, we do have an age for that, the K-4 through first grade. Um, if you have a child that's younger that's with you during the service, they can come up with us, and we'll, we will be going right by the nursery, and we can help uh, get them where they need to be. Uh, but really, the, uh, the lesson and everything for that is for that age group, K-4 through first grade. If you have an older child that's just come off of that and they're still adjusting, we also have our kit for kids. And I uh, haven't mentioned that in a while, so if you're new with us and didn't know about that, we have kit for kids right around the corner here and also in the back that they can pick that up. And that's just to help that older age that might have just come out of children's church uh, to something for them to do and to they can also take notes and stuff but it gives them some activities that they can do here so i want to remind you of that just the children's church time and ages we want to kind of keep it for those ages and we have a great nursery and also some kit for kids here for for the older kids 
Um, so when you're done with the, um, the Connect card, filling that out, please tear that off. Like Matt said, we'd love to hear that. And then you can drop those off. Um, again, at the end of the service today, just a reminder, we'll remind you again is our deacon nomination to, uh, uh, for our members as well. Hang on while we do that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a good time. Let's go uh, to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, just the opportunities to serve you, the, the ones that, that we have uh, coming up in church, the opportunity I had to go with our group last year to, uh, or last week to Smoke Him Out Resort Ministries. God, I thank you for the, the ways that we connect here at our church, both locally and across state lines and internationally, Lord, to, to proclaim your news. And we are here to worship you. God, we are here because you are worthy. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, David picked a, a doozy of a passage for, for his message today, and I am excited about it, but it's also going to be a challenge, so maybe you will be able to see the themes that are being weaved together and the choices of music. So friends, let's stand together and let's be the, the laborers in the vineyard. are the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah.
Blake and Maggie disentangled themselves. Good morning. Our Old Testament reading is from Psalms 118, 19 through 26. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is, why, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Our New Testament reading is 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by God to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite all of you to have a seat. As you guys know, this weekend is a very important anniversary. And all the themes that come about of 9-11 dance around all the things that Jesus talks about in our passage. So let's take just a moment, watch a short video, and then Jerry is going to come and pray. Most of us remember that day. It's etched in our minds, a permanent reminder of tragedy. We all watched helplessly as lives were lost, heroes were born, and a nation was forever changed. The loss was unimaginable, the sorrow unbearable. But through that pain, we witnessed the resolve of a nation we saw chaos give birth to courage. Fear transform into fortitude. And destruction give way to determination. In the midst of the brokenness, freedom stood immovable. Today, we remember those we lost. We honor the heroes who saved so many and grieve with the families who have suffered so much. It's been 20 years, but we still remember, and we will never forget. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to be here in your house, Lord. And Lord, as this is a weekend of remembrance of a very tragic time in this country, Lord, we realize as it, as it was that day, as it was the day before, and every day thereafter, you're still on your throne, Lord. And Lord, as we think of this country, and the freedom that you've given it, that you've blessed us with. The ultimate freedom comes from you, Lord. And knowing your son, Jesus, is our savior. Nothing can stand against that, Lord, when we have him in our lives, when we accept him and receive him as such, Lord. And Lord, in this country, as we think about the freedoms that you've given us, sometimes we feel as if they're being torn from us in ways, Lord and that we see things changing that we don't understand, we've never seen before, Lord. We're facing things we've never faced before. Lord, we know that we can go to you with those concerns, with those feelings of lostness. And Lord, that you can work through them with us. But Lord, we also know that you've given us as a church to be the light and the beacon in this world, Lord and to stand forth with your word as truthfulness, Lord, throughout, and to stand against torrential 
powers that may be that may come against us, Lord, whether they're outbound or even inbound in our own environments. And Lord, we just ask that you guide us and lead us in that. Show us what you'd have for us as a people to go forth and live. And Lord, now as we think of our service today, may this be your service. We turn it over to you, Lord. May it present you with all the glory and worship you deserve, Lord. And as Pastor David speaks, may it be your words that come through him to touch our hearts and draw us closer to you. Lord, we just ask you to be with us all. All these things we ask in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. God is still God. Jesus Christ is still beautiful. And we still sing his praise. So let's stand together and sing of our beautiful, beautiful Savior.
like to continue this theme with one more song.
Kids, it's time to come on forward. Ben has a message just for y'all. All right, guys, come on down. Girls, good to see you. Some more friends coming. All right, how's everybody doing? Anybody play outside any? The weather's feeling really great. Fall time that I love is here. All right. You know, I know some, some families might have been watching some football games the other day. And uh, uh, in football, when you watch a game, there's two teams on the field. But there's some other people that are on the field. Does anybody know who else is on the field other than two teams playing each other in football? Does anybody know? Who is what? Recording the game? Okay, they're kind of on the outside, but there's some people actually on the field with the players as they're running and doing anything. Does anybody know? Huh? That's right, that's right. Yes, there's some officiators on the, on the field. And really, when they are on the field, you know, each team has their coach, so that's kind of in charge of their team. But who's in charge of the rules? You know, you want to know who's in charge. And, and, and it's the referees, okay? And uh, they are in charge of making sure that both teams are playing by the rules and they give penalties if there's people not playing by the rules. Let's listen. And it's really important that they're out there. I mean, can you imagine if two football teams tried to play each other and there was nobody calling any rules out there? There was no referees, no officiators. That would kind of go crazy pretty quickly, I think. Um, so their job, they are in charge of implementing the rules. And there's all sorts of, when we look at different things, there are people in charge. So let me show you an example of this. Now, I don't have the real things because I'm not in charge of these things that I'm about to show you. But these are some things my kids got on a recent trip we went on. And here's one of them. Everybody see that? What does that look like? What's, the, what's like on the side of this badge right here? Here's the badge. Oh, nobody's behind me. There you go. <laughs> huh? Wings. Okay, wings. So there's real badges of this that people wear that have wings. And who do you think they might, what, what do you think they might do? What might they be in charge of? Okay, military. Okay, yeah, maybe our Air Force. That's, that's true. You might see Military, well, we were just on a flight, just on a plane, and the pilot and the co-pilot, they wear the special, the real ones, that they don't give anybody else unless you've gone through the school and training. But you know as soon as you see them, they have a uniform and a hat, that they're the person in charge. And isn't it a good thing that somebody's in charge on the plane, right? Let's shake our head, yes. We, we don't need the football officiators. We don't even need a police officer in charge of flying the plane. We need somebody that's in charge with these wings. Here's another one. So we went in some state park or some national parks, actually. And this is another badge. This is the one the kids got from Rocky Mountain National Park. And this one's, yeah, okay, take care of the animal. Yes, there are park rangers that work at the park, and they have a variety of jobs. It's to protect the animals. It's to make sure people are staying on the correct path that they need to go on. They help with, uh, if there's roadblocks and stuff like that. They help, there's rules inside the National Park, and it's important to have people that are in charge, okay? It's important to have someone in charge. In school right now, when you are in your classroom, your teacher is in charge of that classroom. That's a good thing, right, teachers? That's a good thing. Um, but there's someone that's in charge of our entire lives. There's someone that's in charge of our entire lives. They, they might, you know, we pointed out a plane and then national park. There's someone in charge of us in our entire lives. Who is that? God. God. That's right. And this is a question that came to Jesus a lot. That there were some people who said, Jesus. Are you really in charge? Why are you, who are you? Are you even in charge? And one thing, Jesus looked like a man, just like everybody else in a crowd. But what people didn't realize is that he's God. <laughs> he's God. So listen, this is why Jesus is in charge of our lives and why it's so important. Because he showed the greatest love to us. He died for us. God is creator of us. 
He knows everything there is about us. And so someone that has done that for us, that has saved us from our sins, that died on a cross, that, that rose again, that conquered death, no one else has done that. Jesus did that. And so that means he is the one that's most in charge of our entire life every single day. Okay? And that's what we all need to always remember. And that's really important. And that's a good thing for us. That when we don't know what's going on, maybe we might be scared or have a question about what's going on in our lives, that we know God's in charge. Okay? God's in charge every single day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these children. Thank you for their families. We thank you for the knowledge that you are the one in charge. You have authority over heaven and earth. God, and we are thankful for that. That is freeing to us, Lord, uh, that you are in control. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, K-4 through first grade, you are now invited to Children's Church. Uh, again, if you have a smaller child, we can, uh, they can go up to the nursery. We can drop them off if you have a three-year-old or two-year-old. Uh, if you're older kids, reminder, kit for kids that I mentioned are here in the alcove and in the front. <laughs> Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. So last week we looked at how Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey as the people laid their clothes and palm branches down and they praised him as the messianic son of David, the king of the Jews. And that he was coming into Jerusalem and, and this of course worried the religious leaders in Jerusalem, right? They, they saw Jesus as a threat to their influence and power. They uh, were worried that Jesus might catch Rome's attention with this kind of talk and, and, and cause some problems for life in Judea. So they were worried. But then the next day, matters got even worse as the same Jesus of Nazareth caused a commotion in the temple. He was in the temple overturning the tables of the money changers. He was letting the, do the doves fly free. He was chasing out the sacrificial animals with a whip. And as he was doing it, he was ranting and raving about how his father's house was supposed to be a house of prayer, but they had made it into a den of thieves. Something had to be done about this man. So on Tuesday, when Jesus dared to show his face in the temple again of all places... Teaching a growing crowd, the religious leaders knew they had to confront him. They, had to, they, they could not let this go unanswered. They had to know, who did he think he was? Where did he get off acting this way? By what authority did he think he could speak like this? Who is in charge of the temple anyway? The, 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 the Sanhedrin and the priests or this rabble-rousing rabbi from the backwoods of Galilee. Who is in charge here? And that's where we pick up the story in verse 27 of Mark 11. They came again to Jerusalem. This is on Tuesday. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes and elders came and asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus said to them, I'll ask you one question. Then answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was John's baptism from heaven or of human origin? Answer me. They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he'll say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, then, then they were afraid of the crowd because everyone thought that John was truly a prophet. So they answered him, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. See, the religious authorities both wanted to discredit Jesus in the eyes of the people, but they also wanted to frame him with some kind of crime that would force Rome's hand to take care of him for them. And Jesus was perfectly aware of all this. He knew their motivation. He knew their plans, and he decided to use this confrontation for his own purposes, to further establish that he was the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and he was the final authority over the Torah, the temple, and truth itself. 
these confrontations that happened mainly on Tuesday, but, but a few other times you know, into Wednesday, they took the form of a contest of questions. And this first question was a question of authority. Who is in charge here? Or as the chief priests, elders, and scribes put it, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you the authority to do these things? Now those are good questions. And in asking those questions, really the Sanhedrin, this almost like the Jewish Supreme Court of Religious Authority, this, this group of Sanhedrin, they were actually kind of doing their job. You see, the, the Torah gave them the job and the authority to investigate anyone who claimed to come from God or speak for God. In fact, back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses uh, prophesies that someday God will raise up a prophet like himself that the people had to answer to and obey. And it says this, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers, and you must listen to him. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. I will hold accountable whoever does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name. Now, by the time of Jesus, this was understood to be the Messiah, that the Messiah was going to be this prophet like Moses. But Moses also went on to tell them that, look, even though there's coming this prophet someday you must listen to, there will also be false prophets you should listen to. And so he goes on to say, but the prophet who presumes to speak a message in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet must die. And you may say to yourself, how can we recognize a message the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the Lord's name and the message does not come true or is not fulfilled, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. Do not be afraid of him. So in a way, the Sanhedrin, that's what they were doing. They were, they were, you know, it looked like they were investigating. Is this a true prophet? Is this the Messiah or is he a false prophet? But it looked like that's what they were doing on the outside. But that's not what their heart motivation was on the inside. And Jesus knew this. He knew their hearts. They weren't truly investigating his teachings to see if they were true. They'd already made up their mind about Jesus. They weren't looking for truth. They were looking for ammunition that they could use against him. And Jesus decided to play their little game. But he was going to turn the tables on them and lay a trap of his own. Really in asking these two questions, what the Pharisees and Sadducees in this group, what they were trying to get to were two things about Jesus' authority. The first was the nature of his authority. Or, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the nature of his authority. They want to know the nature of his authority. Was Jesus just an overzealous rabbi who wanted to bring religious reform and revival to the people? Was he claiming a religious authority? Or, as the crowd seemed to think, was Jesus claiming a political authority? Was he trying to set himself up as king and overthrow the Roman Empire? What was the nature of his authority? Religious or political? Spiritual or secular? That's what they wanted to know. But secondly, they wanted to know the source of his authority. Was his authority just simply that of a man? Was he just a man? Like every other man, speaking as a man. If so, then you know, we'll just kind of let this play out. And you know, maybe we'll try to catch him, you know, trap him in some kind of a, uh, you know, a verbal misstep so that the people will lose interest in him. Or, and this was, the, this was the option that scared them the most, was his authority from God? Was he really speaking and acting as someone sent from God? Because if that was the case, then there was really nothing they could do except kill him. So again, Jesus knew all of this. And that's why Jesus redirected the conversation to the ministry of John the Baptist. What was the nature and source of John's authority? And this question really put them on the defense and it exposed their real motivation, which was their own power, their own influence and control. It's all about political power. It's not about principles. It's not about truth. And so they weren't going to acknowledge Jesus' divine authority nor were they going to deny John's authority because that would get them in trouble with all the people. So they took the safe route. And they answered, we don't know. We don't know. Now, of course, this answer really exposed their weakness because it showed that they really didn't care about the truth of the Torah or about the temple. They really didn't care because if they, if they really believed that Jesus and John were just men and had no authority from God, 
and yet they refused to publicly denounce them right here. They were really abdicating their, their purpose and their job. They were exposing themselves in a stunning, embarrassing display of cowardice that really put politics ahead of their, ahead of their self-proclaimed principles. So Jesus refused to directly answer their question. Not because Jesus was being evasive, but because he didn't want to endorse their hypocrisy. See, Jesus didn't directly answer their question as a way of refuting their authority. Now, I say Jesus didn't directly answer their question because he then goes on to use a parable and an object lesson to exactly answer their question. He's going to tell them the nature and the source of his authority. Now, why is this all relevant to us today before we get deeper into this? Well, it's because questions of authority are being asked today. This question is just as relevant today. The political powers in our society, be they political or economic or cultural or even religious, whenever those powers feel threatened, whenever their preferred narrative is challenged, that's what they ask. Who are you? Who do you think you are? By what authority do you say or do these things? Who put you in charge? We see today parental authority is being questioned. You go to there's school board meetings all over the country over this. Who's in charge of your children? You or the state? Who has authority in the lives of your children? Who gets to have a say in their education? When it comes to the issue of protecting the unborn, whenever a reasonable argument is made based on logic and science as well as scripture, what they will come back with is things like, you know, you're just a man trying to control a woman's body. Leave my body alone. You can't tell me what to do with my body. This is a private matter between a woman and her doctor. In other words, what they're saying is, by what authority do you have to tell a woman what she can and can't do with her body? Who are you to say whether I can kill the baby in my womb or not? Who put you in charge over me? That's what they're saying. When it comes to the issues of race relations, critical race theory proponents will say that America is an inherently and curably racist country in its roots, that white supremacy infects every institution of society, and if you're a white person, you are complicit in the crimes and injustices of your ancestors. That's what they will say. But if you dare speak back with accurate statistics, with actual history, with logic, or heaven forbid, scripture, then you're going to be called a racist for even raising the question. You're called a racist for citing the facts or for using logic. And if you deny that you're a racist or a bigot, well, that's just proof positive that you are a racist and a bigot. While people are told that they could never understand or be able to speak to racism as an issue. In other words, by what authority do you speak about this issue? Who put you in charge? Listen, we could go on like this about a host of issues, LGBTQ issues, uh, religious liberty issues, gun control, the environment, on and on. Who is in charge of churches and religious schools? That's a big fight that's coming, y'all. Who gets to decide who we as a church hire or have to let go? Do we get that say or does the government get to say that? When it comes to religious schools, we're seeing battles in the courts right now over whether a religious school gets to hire and fire teachers based on their beliefs and principles or what the government says you have to do. Just this past week, the question for your business, who is in charge, you as the employer, as the owner, or the federal government? Who is in charge? This is a massive issue today. And they will tell you not to use the Bible to speak to these issues because faith is a personal matter that should be kept private. Our own President of the United States claiming to be a Catholic, claiming to adhere to the teachings of a Catholic church which says that life begins at, at, at conception and that it is sacred until death. He even says that he believes that, but he won't allow his faith to influence his policies. I'm sorry, but that is just as cowardly as an answer as the Pharisees saying we don't know. Amen. Because the question is, when it comes to who is in charge, you can't have it both ways. You can't be lukewarm on this. Jesus said you're either against me or you are for me. 
So by what authority can we say that the unborn life must be protected as sacred? Who gives us the authority to say that marriage is between a man and a woman? Are these just religious claims? Are these just personal beliefs that should stay in our Bibles, our homes, and our churches? Or are these universal truth claims that should have a bearing on the laws of the land? That's the question. And Jesus tells us that God is in charge, that he does have ultimate authority over the cosmos, and that means the temple and Jerusalem and all of Israel as well. And so Jesus uses a parable to expose the true intentions in their hearts. And in so doing, Jesus explains the source of his authority, that his authority, just as John's authority, is from God. And I think that we can use this parable to illustrate for us as 21st century Christians that God is in charge of His church. God is in charge of Israel. God is in charge of His church. God is in charge of His people. Let's look at chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. He began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug out a pit for a wine press, built a watchtower, and then he leased it to tenant farmers and went away. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers to collect some of the fruit of the vineyard from them, but they took him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Well, then the master sent another servant to them, and they hit him on the head and treated him shamefully, and he sent another, and they killed that one. And he also sent many others, some they beat, and others they killed. He still had one to send, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenant farmers said to one another, This is the heir, come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill the farmers and give the vineyard to others. Have you read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and is wonderful in our eyes. So how did the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and priests and elders respond? They were looking for a way to arrest him, but feared the crowd because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they left him and went away. Jesus obviously uses this parable to implicate them in John the Baptist's death as well as in his own impending death at the end of this week. But the parable also speaks to the question of authority and ownership. Who is in charge of the vineyard? Is it the owner or the tenants? The tenants had come to believe that they were in charge and they were willing to do whatever they could to protect what they thought was theirs. They came to see the owner as a threat and so they killed his messengers. They even killed his son. Well, the Pharisees and and, and this group, the, the Sanhedrin immediately knew that Jesus was speaking this parable against them because Jesus was basing this parable on Isaiah chapter 5 1 through 7. Look with me on the screen or in your Bibles. Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. We need to understand this background of this parable. Isaiah says, I will sing about the one I love, a song about my loved one's vineyard. The one I love had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. Sounds just like what Jesus was saying in his parable. He expected it to yield good grapes but it yielded worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. This is now God speaking. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? Now I will tell you what I'm about to going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. I will tear down its walls and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or weeded. Thorns and briars will grow up, and I will give orders to the clouds that rain should not fall on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah the plant he delighted in. He expected justice, but saw injustice. He expected righteousness, but heard cries of despair. So Isaiah sings this song about God as an owner and and tender of a vineyard. And he he plants this vineyard, the people of Israel. He provides for them and protects them and tends to them so that they would produce only the best grapes, the best fruit, righteousness and justice. But what did God get in return for all of his investment? Worthless grapes. 
So God judged the vineyard. He tore down the protecting wall. This is obviously a prophecy of Babylon, which would soon come in and tear down the walls of Jerusalem and leave it abandoned and, and, and full of weeds and untended. Grapevines were a national symbol for Israel. They were carved all over the temple. So clearly this parable was about Israel and how they had treated God's servants, the prophets. You see, the servants in the parable, prophets in the Old Testament were often referred to as servants, such as in Jeremiah 7.25, where God says, I've sent all my servants, the prophets, to you time and time again. And Israel had a history of time and time again mistreating and abusing and persecuting and killing God's prophets. As Nehemiah chapter 9 says, that they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They flung your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed terrible blasphemies. If you read Hebrews 11, it goes into great detail about the, the way the people of Israel had so progressively mistreated and abused and murdered the prophets of God. Well, in the parable, the master finally had enough. And so he sent his only beloved son, saying, certainly they will respect my son. Now, why would the master think that they would respect the son? Because the son represented the father. The son represented the master, right? He had authority. But we know that the tenant farmers actually killed the son as well. Jesus here is answering the question about the source of his authority. He is saying that he is the Son of God, that he has come from the Master of Israel, Yahweh, the great I Am, the Lord God of Israel. He is the source of Jesus' authority. And he's putting the question to them, will you kill me as well? Now, this story in a way seems kind of ludicrous, doesn't it? I mean, you think about it, what was in the mind of these tenant farmers? And they're mistreating and they're abusing and they're killing the master's servants, his messengers, and, and then they, they kill the master's son. What did they think they were going to get out of this? Did they think they were going to get away with it? Were they not afraid of him raining down ret retribution on their heads? It seems kind of silly. That's exactly the point. Jesus was illustrating that the Jewish people, and by extension, all of humanity, we are foolish to think that we can rebel against our Creator God and somehow escape His divine wrath. You see, sin is illogical. There's nothing logical about sin because sin is a rejection of the authority of our Maker. Think about the, the, the Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Why did they want to eat the forbidden fruit? Because they wanted to be like God. They were already made in God's image. What more did they want? They wanted authority. They wanted to be able to determine what was good and evil. They wanted to be able to say for themselves what was right and wrong, what was true and false. And we do the same thing today. That's why issues of morality and ethics are always biblical issues. That's why we as Christians do have authority to speak to issues like this. In fact, we're compelled by God to speak the truth about sexual morality and the meaning of marriage and the value of human life from conception to the grave. Our authority to speak truthfully on issues like race and economics and violence and war and health care, that authority comes from God Himself because God's Word speaks to these issues. Really, this is what we've been talking about, those of you with me, on Wednesday nights. It's all about worldview. What is your worldview? And if, if the 20th anniversary of 9-11 doesn't remind us of anything else, it should remind us of the fact that we are in a war of worldviews. And that war took very physical, real shape on September 11th, 2001. But it is nonetheless real today. The tenant farmers of many churches today and of the broader culture have rejected God's authority and they are trying to silence His servants today. Bible-believing Christians, we are considered the enemy. But we're called to be salt and light. To be ambassadors of Christ. To represent God's will and ways in a dark and decaying world. We are commanded to speak the truth of God's word to people so that they will be convicted by the Spirit and hopefully turn in faith to Jesus. And then we're to teach them to obey all the things that God commanded. That's the Great Commission, right? And you know what Jesus gives us in the Great Commission? He gives us His power, His presence, and His authority. 
Look at Matthew chapter 28. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Now that therefore means that Jesus is saying, because I have authority, I am giving you the authority to go into all the nations and make disciples. I'm giving you the authority to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am giving you the authority to teach them to obey all the things I command you and to back up that authority. I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age. Based on this, Paul calls us ambassadors for Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.20, saying, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making His appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, Jesus is also honest enough later on to tell us that we should expect to be rejected and persecuted just as he was. The world will hate us for this just as it hated him for this. And then Jesus puts the question to the religious leaders asking, what will the owner do? Of course, echoing Isaiah 5.5 where God says, I will tell you what I'm about to do to my vineyard. And sadly, we know that in A.D. 70, God once again tore down the walls of the vineyard when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and left it a burning pile of ash. Now, who are the others that God is going to give this vineyard to? Listen carefully. The others are the church. The followers of Jesus, made up of both Jewish and Gentile believers. The church is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that through his descendants, all peoples on the earth would be blessed. Now, this is not what some call replacement theology. Replacement theology says that the church replaced Israel as God's people, that all of God's promises to Israel were then negated. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Rather, he's saying that believing Gentiles will join and have joined with believing Jews to create a new covenant community. And there isn't a remnant of Israel within the church that maintains that continuity from the old covenant to the new covenant. Now Jesus then ends this parable quoting a messianic psalm and what he's pointing out to them is that he is the son that they will reject and kill but God will take that rejected stone and make him the cornerstone. That Jesus is the center of the salvation authority. As Ben said, he's the one who died and rose from the grave and therefore therefore he has final authority and say over all matters religious. Over all matters period as we will soon see. Jesus is next confronted by a second group, the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, this is fascinating because the Pharisees and Herodians didn't like each other. They were polar opposites. You can think of the Pharisees as representing the conservative right-wing Jews, and the Herodians, were, were, uh, they kind of uh, represented the uh, elitist left-wing citizens of Jerusalem, right? The, 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 the high and highfalutin people. That was the Herodians. The, the Pharisees hated Rome. They, they detested Rome's influence. The Herodians loved it. They benefited from it. They, they did more than accommodate it. But, you know, as the saying goes, the enemy of your enemy is your friend, friend right? So they, they bound themselves together to go after Jesus. And Jesus uses this controversy in one of the great, brilliant switch-ups in history to demonstrate that his authority not only comes from God, the source of his authority, but the nature of his authority. And he tells us that God isn't just in charge of the church. God is in charge of the nations. Let's look at verse 13. Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to trap him in his words. And when they came, they said to him, Teacher, we know you are truthful. Don't care what anyone thinks, nor do you show partiality, but teach the way of God truthfully. So they're buttering him up, right? They're flattering him. They don't really believe this. Here's the question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought a coin. Whose image and inscription is this? They asked him. Caesar's, they replied. And Jesus told them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they were utterly amazed at him. So the Pharisees and the Herodians thought they had the perfect trap for Jesus because no matter how Jesus answered, they had him. The Herodians supported the tax. Now, this was a poll tax. This was a tax that every non-Roman citizen had to pay every year. And in fact, the imposition of this tax in 86 is what led to the creation of the zealots, right? 
So the zealots were completely against this. Well, the Pharisees were against it too. The Pharisees saw this as, 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 as blasphemous, that they would have to pay this tribute of allegiance to a pagan emperor. So they, they didn't like this. So no matter which side Jesus came on, down on this very politically sensitive issue, he was trapped. He's either going to anger Rome and the Herodians are going to go tattle on him or he's going to anger the people. And the Pharisees are going to say, see, look, he's a Roman sympathizer. But Jesus blew their mind. He did what they didn't expect. He he answered in this simple yet sophisticated reply by asking for a Roman denarius. And he asked, whose inscription and image are on this? Well, the image was Emperor Tiberius. And the inscription on one side read Tiberius Caesar, the divine Augustus, and on the other side it said the chief priest. So the Pharisees saw this as blasphemous and idolatrous, right? They were completely turned off by this. So Jesus, when he answered, he neither denied the paying of the taxes nor did he defend it. Rather, Jesus made one of the most important political statements in history as well as a deeply theological argument about the nature and scope of God's authority. Jesus' opponents were trying to frame this in a God versus government argument, right? That you couldn't faithfully worship God if you're going to submit to the Roman government. But Jesus made the point that in His sovereignty, God established kings and governments. Therefore, obeying God is compatible with submitting to the government. In fact, it's required. If you're going to obey God, you must submit to the government that is under the umbrella of God's ultimate authority. Jesus' use of the image of Tiberius is brilliant in two ways. The first way is that in, in ancient thinking, the coin actually literally belonged to the person whose name and image was on it. So in their economy, the coin literally belonged to Caesar. Now that doesn't quite apply to us and our economics today, but the second meaning behind this does. Jesus, when he asks whose image is this, is obviously referring back to Genesis 1.27, where it says that God made humanity in his image. Jesus is saying that everyone, including Emperor Tiberius, is made in the image of God. And that is why God has ultimate authority over everyone. And the emperor's authority comes underneath God's authority. It's granted by God's authority. That's why we can give to Caesar what he is due. I hate to say it, even our taxes. But the broader implication. The broader implication is that there's no such thing as a secular sphere and a sacred or spiritual sphere. See, that's what the the argument was trying to set this up. Like there's two different spheres. There's God and there's government. There's religious and there's secular. But Jesus is saying that everything is spiritual. That God is sovereign over Rome and God is sovereign over the United States. God is sovereign over Caesar and God is sovereign over Congress. The secular is always subject to the spiritual. Did you hear that? The secular is always subject to the spiritual. Now in the city of God, his his great work, Augustine outlined the dual citizenship of Christians. That we are citizens of man-made states, but we're also citizens of God's kingdom. But as citizens of God's kingdom, that is our first and foremost duty. Because our citizenship is eternal. We're temporary residents on this earth. So in in one way you can think of our American citizenship as a temporary work visa. Or better yet, we are actually God's ambassadors to the United States of America. We are God's divine representatives to this land. And that means that we've been given authority by Jesus to pray for, to speak to, to work in and to transform every sphere of society. Listen, there is no place where the gospel doesn't apply. There's no issue God's word is not sufficient to guide us in how to think and live. There's no job or place or activity that falls outside the scope of God's authority. None. And as ambassadors of Christ, as disciple makers, as salt and light, we have a mandate to speak out for and to stand up for what is true and right, to speak for those who have no voice, to defend the defenseless, to work for biblical justice, to help those in need. And we do it with a biblical worldview. We do it in the name of Jesus. We do it in the hope of helping people come to know love and follow Him as their Lord and Savior. 
This means that our submission to governing authorities comes underneath our ultimate submission to God. Giving to Caesar what is Caesar's is just one part of giving to God what is God's. That's the amazing thing about what Jesus said. He was saying there are no two spheres that never the twain shall meet. Jesus was bringing government's rule under the authority of God. And that means that as Christian citizens, we have a duty, as 1 Timothy 2 says, to pray for our government. We have a duty to obey the laws when they don't contradict God's clear law. We have a duty as Americans to get involved, to vote, to speak out, to, to be informed. Listen, maybe even to run for office. As Christians, we have a duty to be involved in the civic life of our community. Now there's a lot more we can say about how we as Christians function as citizens. And I encourage you to read, these are in your notes, read Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2 about how and when to submit to the government. Also read Acts chapter 4 and 5 about how and when not to submit to the government. Sometimes the Christian thing to do is to resist the government. But the basic question I want you to consider today, who is in charge of your life? Who has authority over you? Is it you? Is it someone else? Is it some other belief system? Is it some addiction or habit? Who is in charge of your life? Where do your allegiances lie? In God's kingdom or the world's kingdom? Will you submit to His authority in your life? Will you let God be in charge? I invite you to come today and to say, God, I've been running the show. I've been, I've been letting other people call the shots. I've I've been a slave to this habit or this addiction in my life. God, I want you to be in charge. Forgive me of my sins and live within me. I want to invite you to come today and make that decision. Jesus died on the cross to set you free from all other masters so that you could live and serve Him in true freedom. Today's invitation really is a call for profound commitment to God. We all bear God's image by virtue of our humanity. And we're all guilty, maybe not of physically abusing or killing messengers or Jesus, but every day we deny Him, every day we resist Him. That's what we're doing in our heart. Or will you receive Jesus as the master of your life? Even as Christians, listen, we can be guilty sometimes of, of shutting God off into this little corner of our heart. And we'll pull Him out on Sundays. For really good Christians, we'll pull Him out on Wednesday nights too. But what about Monday morning? What about Friday night? What about Saturday afternoon when you're watching that football game and you feel the temperature rising and your ears are turning red and you're getting a little agitated? Is Jesus in charge of your life then? Would you stand and pray with me? Father, you do have all authority. You are sovereign. You are in charge of this universe. You hold it in the palm of your hand. It exists because you spoke it into existence. And we are here as bearers of your image. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now whether people acknowledge that, whether people live by that, or in open rebellion against you, that's the difference. If there's anybody listening today online, on the radio, in this building, that knows that they've been living in rebellion against you, I pray they would come now in humility and repent of that and submit to your rule and reign in their lives. And let's experience the grace of your forgiveness and the freedom of life, the abundance of life that you promise, Lord. Father, we all answer to somebody. Somebody's in charge of us. There's nobody better to submit to than you. Father, as believers, as Christians, help us to also, especially help us, to live in obedience to you. Because not only are we made in your image, we're being conformed into the image of Christ. So help us to live for you more every day and to extend your grace and mercy to speak courageously and compassionately to the issues of our day, to be truthful, but to always do it with gentleness and respect. Because the end goal, Lord, isn't to win the argument, it's to win the person, to win them to faith in Christ. Lord, help us to be obedient to you, whatever you're speaking to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Amen. You may have a seat. Today begins the week of prayer for uh, Georgia Baptist Missions, and we're going to be collecting all this month the Mission Georgia offering. Uh, it's a really neat thing because here in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be able to be the recipient of some of those Georgia Baptist Mission funds through the Mission Georgia offering as we are hosting a one-day fun day to minister to the foster care families in our region. And so I want you to watch this brief video, and then we're going to pray. Uh, and I hope that you'll use that guide in your order of worship. Take it home with you. Join me in praying every day this week for Georgia Baptist Missions. And I pray that you would very prayerfully consider how God would have you to give above and beyond to support the great work that Georgia Baptists are doing in our state. Numbers, statistics, data. When we're talking about population demographics, numbers have names. Numbers are our neighbors. They are real people. A child in the Athens area has been waiting to be adopted since he was four years old. Now he's 12. Will you adopt him? There are 203 in foster care in Bibb County and only 56 homes for them. Statewide, 400 of our young neighbors in foster care will sleep in hotel rooms again tonight because there are not enough foster families in Georgia. Will you volunteer? Numbers are our neighbors. One of our neighbor families fled persecution in India and now lives in Decatur. They have several children, including one who is deaf. They live in an apartment with no furniture, beds, or other items for daily life. Will you help them? Many of our young neighbors in Moultrie, Thomasville, Tifton, Augusta, Savannah, Macon, Valdosta, Athens, and Dalton are being trafficked for sex. These cities have the highest rate of human trafficking outside Metro Atlanta. Would your church welcome them with all their brokenness? Numbers are our neighbors. Georgia is the third deadliest state in America for expectant mothers with little to no access to doctors or health care. Pre and postnatal care is essential to their survival. Will your church reach out and serve them? In Hancock County, more than half the children in third grade are not reading at grade level. Will you read to them? In Luke chapter 10, a teacher of the law asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus proceeded to tell him the story of the Good Samaritan. And then he asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The one who showed mercy to him said, then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. As we go, we bring the gospel of Jesus in word and action. We are Mission Georgia. Go and do the same. together for Mission Georgia. Father, we're thankful for our state. We're thankful to live here, but Father, we are just heartbroken over the needs around us, Lord. And it's so easy for us to turn a blind eye to that because we get so caught up in our, in our daily life, but I pray, Father, you would open our eyes and burden our hearts to how we can pray for and get involved in and give toward making a real difference in the lives of real people. Lord, these are our neighbors that we're talking about. They may not be across the street, but they're across the county. They're on the other side of the CSRA. They're elsewhere in the state of Georgia, and you have put them here for us to minister to, God. Give us a vision. Give us a passion. Give us a burden. We pray you would take the offering we give this month, bless it, along with the offering of thousands of churches across our state, to do what is beyond our wildest dreams. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 The Harris family has come. Uh, Jeff, Gloria, Landon, y'all come stand up here with me. They've been worshiping with us now for, uh, for a good month or two. And uh, we have just, uh, Jeff and I had a great visit this past week, had a wonderful conversation. And they have come on promise of letter and are moving here, have moved here to Thompson. They're new to our community. Uh, recently retired from the pastorate and uh, it's always great to have a, a man of the word uh, here to, to, to be a part of our church. And, and you will bless us and enhance us by your being here. And we hope to bless and enhance you by being a church that can help you to grow and thrive and worship and serve. And look forward to land and coming to know Christ soon. And 
So we're going to welcome them, if, if you would so do, uh, into our church fellowship with a hearty amen. 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 God bless y'all. We are so thrilled and glad to have you here at First Baptist Church. I'm going to ask y'all to join me in the atrium after this uh, because there's t-shirts for sale there. So if you'll come by the atrium and make your t-shirt order and just say hello to Jeff and Gloria and to Landon. And we're so glad to have them here with us. Um, but y'all can have a seat for right now. And, uh, you know, as if we've not packed enough in today's uh, service, we now have our deacon selection process. And to our guests, we are grateful that you have spent this time with us, and we don't want to take any more of your time. If you need to slip out right now, we totally understand that. There is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But to our members, this is a very important and, and prayerful moment as we are participating in the process our church uses to help men be identified and called to serve as deacons. And we've got ushers that are now going to be passing out uh, these ballots. Uh, we ask you to circle up to and no more than eight names. If you circle nine, we'll have to throw out your ballot. So please, circle only up to eight names. I hope you've been praying over these names, and I hope that you will allow God's Spirit to guide you in this process. If you're a member of the church, would you just stand up? And when you get your ballot, you can have a seat. wonderful godly men and, and would do well to serve our church. 